This first of the diabetes lessons is going to be about type 2 diabetes and its management. The way I've constructed the series is such that the things we talk about in this lesson you should all associate with type 2 diabetes. Because type 1 diabetes has a completely different pathogenesis and must be managed with insulin, in the next lesson, we'll talk about insulins and type 1 diabetes. There's a lot more overlap than that, right? And of course, it's not just type 1 and type 2, but at this level of training, I want you to form memories around type 2, separate from the ones around type 1, except as much as hyperglycemic complications affect both. In the last lesson, we'll talk about diabetic emergencies. So to kick this off, I want to talk about the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. And this is important because it's going to help explain why the new guidelines have the medications listed that they do, and it coincidentally matches with nutritional guidelines. That's the meal. This is the pancreas. In the fasting state, the glucagon dominant state, there's a little bit of glucose around in the bloodstream and not activated insulin receptors. In the fed state, the insulin dominant state, a lot of glucose comes in from the diet. The pancreas senses that and releases insulin, which activates the insulin receptors on the cells of metabolism. Activation of insulin receptors in the, in the cells of metabolism, adipocytes and skeletal muscle myocytes, induces the insertion of a vesicle with GLUT4 transporters into the plasma membrane. All cells have the ability to take up a small amount of glucose. The cells of metabolism have GLUT4. Under the influence of insulin, the vesicle is inserted, and that enables a massive diffusion of glucose out of the bloodstream and into those cells. The normal effect is to shift glucose into the cells of metabolism to bring the blood glucose back to normal. What happens in type 2 diabetes, however, is that there is a chronically elevated blood, glu blood glucose. The pancreas will respond to that elevated blood glucose by increasing the amount of insulin. This is chronic now. The cells of metabolism have a failsafe. If they receive a chronically stimulated insulin signal, the cells of metabolism downregulate the expression of insulin receptors. If there are fewer insulin receptors and no change in insulin, that is going to lead to an accumulation of blood glucose, which is going to cause the pancreas to make more insulin, which is going to cause the cell's metabolism to downregulate their insulin receptors. The cycle goes on and on and on, such that there is an elevated blood sugar and an elevated insulin. That downregulation of the insulin receptors causes the actual pathogenesis behind type 2 diabetes. It's called insulin resistance. The blood glucose will cause the complications that we're just about to talk about. And controlling the blood glucose will prevent those complications from happening. Yes. However, this is the thing we need to treat in type 2 diabetes. And it's not at all related to type 1. And worst of all, insulin is a growth factor. And so while the signal to insert GLUT4 transporters may be weaker, the signal to grow adiposity, obesity, is not. 
All right, so before we get into the details of the stuff, here's what the absolute must know takeaways about type two diabetes. A sedentary lifestyle and excess calories usually resulting in obesity. Not all of these have to be present, but this is the zero standard deviations from the mean classic illness script. Leads to chronically elevated blood glucose, which leads to chronically elevated insulin. Type two diabetes is a hyper insulinemic state and hyperglycemia. The sedentary lifestyle, excess calories, and obesity lead to insulin resistance. Most patients with diabetes are asymptomatic. They don't know they have it. This could be in the pre-diabetic state or diabetes. They're going to get an asymptomatic screen. In those who are symptomatic, they're going to have the complication symptoms and not hyperglycemic symptoms. A patient may present with hyperglycemic symptoms. Polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss. But that's the presentation for type 1 diabetes, so I want you to separate them. Most of the time, type 2 diabetes does not present with that but it will present with the complications we're about to talk about or be part of an asymptomatic screening. To diagnose a patient with type 2 diabetes, if they do have hyperglycemic symptoms, you need only one test, and that's a random plasma glucose over 200 milligrams per deciliter. If there are no hyperglycemic symptoms, you need two tests. You can perform the same test twice, but you need two. And you can choose from the hemoglobin A1C, the fasting plasma glucose, and or the two-hour plasma glucose, which is also called the two-hour oral glucose tolerance test. The treatment for all patients with type 2 diabetes is diet and exercise. Eat fewer calories from better food sources. Aerobic exercise, more important than, but also in addition to resistance training. And patients should be referred. Send them to a registered dietary nutritionist, dietitian, a certified diabetic educator. This can help with self-management as well as general education in diabetes. And at least all patients should be screened for depression and anxiety and refer to a mental health provider if screened positive. The treatment for type two diabetes used to be a jumble of medications and options. As of January, 2022, no more of that. The treatment is metformin first, then if the A1C goal is not met, add either a GLP-1 agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. If not controlled on one, add the other. If all three fail to reach goal, add insulin. And we'll talk about insulin in the next lesson. Insulin should not be seen as a failure. Insulin will be used to control the blood sugar to prevent the complications we're about to talk about. But adding insulin to this system, where there's already hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, is only going to exacerbate the problem. Control the blood sugar so they don't die, and then over long term, diet and exercise, reverse the insulin resistance, get them off the insulin. Diabetes is an atherosclerosis equivalent. The target A1C is less than 7% in all comers. 
and then there needs to be screening. Every year, screen for retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Retinopathy with a dilated eye exam, Nephropathy with an albumin to creatinine ratio obtained from a urinalysis. And neuropathy with a, quote, monofilament test. Sensory exam for the feet. This is the takeaway. You have to know this. Now let's get into some more details. Starting with the complications. The complications caused by a chronically elevated blood glucose. The complications come from two main mechanisms. The first is non-enzymatic glycation, represented poorly and inaccurately as glycosylation in about half of the instances in the space, education and industry. It is not glycosylation. Now you may say, eh, what's the difference? Well, actually everything. Uh, the way I envision this is glycosylation is enzymatic, cellular, and appropriate. It's an assembly line where the same amino acid sequence comes one after the other. And the assembly line glycosylates, adds a sugar to the amino acid sequence. The same sugar to the same amino acid over and over and over again glycosylation is supposed to happen. It makes the protein function the way it does. At the end of the conveyor belt is a bin in which all of the same amino acid sequence with the same glycosylation is stored. On the way out the door, someone takes a big jug of honey and pours it all over that bin. Honey is thick, sweet, and oozes all over those proteins in a haphazard fashion. The honey is glycation. The glycosylation is the assembly line. Because it is non-enzymatic, it can't be undone. Our bodies don't know how to handle it. Handle it. Non-enzymatic glycation is going to give us advanced glycation end products. AGEs. AGEs activate the receptor for advanced glycation end products, RAGE. Clever name. But medical science not sure what RAGEs are for physiologically. We do know, though, what happens when you activate them in excess. And it is what gives us both the macrovascular complications of diabetes and the microvascular complications. If you activate rage on endothelial cells, become leaky. The endothelial cells themselves will produce protein between them and the basement membrane. Protein deposition, leaky capillaries, loose endothelium. Those proteins that get glycated haphazardly by excess blood sugar can also serve to trap other proteins, even if those other proteins are not glycated. For example, LDL. Rage activation results in endothelial dysfunction. That causes the capturing of LDL in a proteinaceous matrix which is glycated and not able to be handled by the immune system. It tries anyway, and you end up with a necrotic lipid core. Activation of RAGE causes the vascular smooth muscle cells of the tunica media to proliferate into the tunica intima, where it forms a fibrocollagenous cap. That sounds an awful lot like atherosclerosis. Indeed, the macrovascular complications 
lead to extremely accelerated atherosclerosis. It is both the endothelial dysfunction and the trapping of LDL, as well as the activation of the tunica media that leads to the same thing that is atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis can be in any organ because every organ has arteries. The ones people care the most about, though, are coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, and peripheral vascular disease. And their acute rupture and thrombosis equivalents, myocardial infarction, stroke, and acute limb ischemia. Atherosclerosis is going to be treated with a statin and an antiplatelet, such as aspirin. Leaky capillaries happen too. Right? So this is what happens with big blood vessels, large and medium-sized arteries at branch points. The microvascular complications are a result of leaky capillaries. And I think the easiest way to understand leaky capillaries is with the effect on the kidney. That leads to nephropathy. If the glomerular capillary is leaky, proteins can get out. Proteins can get out. Well, the proteins can get out and they go to the interstitium, that is over there with the mesangial cells. Proteins are going to accumulate within the glomerulus. The mesangial cells are going to get pushed aside. And over time, more and more protein escapes into the interstitium. More and more protein leads to a space occupying protein, which eventually collapses by compression those glomerular capillaries. If that protein gets out into the filtrate, you're going to find that protein in the urine. That's not supposed to be there. We look for nephropathy with the albumin to creatinine ratio of the urine as a surrogate for how much protein has leaked out in the kidney. The number one cause of dialysis and stage renal disease, diabetes. Treat the nephropathy with an ARP. The other thing that leaky capillaries causes is the retinopathy, in which small blood vessels undergo angiogenesis, trying to maintain perfusion and in doing so, block light from the retina. That leads to blindness. And that can be treated with laser therapy. Diabetes takes your eyes, kidneys, limb, and life. And it all has to do with non-enzymatic glycation. The other pathogenic pathway is sorbitol. Aldose reductase has no business working on glucose. There's a very low affinity, but when there's a lot of it, it can turn glucose into sorbitol, which is trapped in the cells and leads to osmotic swelling. Osmotic swelling can cause cataracts when it's in the lens of the eye and neuropathy. Now, this is a big fudge because the pathogenesis of neuropathy is more complicated than just osmotic swelling, but I'm trying to color code both mechanism and outcome to make this easier for you to retrieve later. The thing to know about neuropathy is that the longest nerves are affected first. This is a practical application in the sense that there will be sensory changes in the feet before the vagus nerve will be affected. Therefore, if someone has gastroparesis without sensory changes, they probably don't have gastroparesis. We'll talk about gastroparesis in gastroenterology. Well, it makes sense that uh, we should be treating people who have high blood sugar and get the blood sugar down. We can't do that unless we know that they have diabetes. And this is the way you can both screen and confirm the diagnosis. Each of these tests represent a range. Above a certain level, there is definitely diabetes. Below a certain level, the patient does not have diabetes, which would be considered normal. In between is a range of blood sugars, or the range of values, 